good evening and welcome to Fracking Nightmare. Uh, I think this is episode 25. I can't believe where the weeks have gone and uh, so much still to talk about and this battle is heating up. This week the House of Lords Economics Committee have recommended that this country needs to get fracking. But more of that in a second, because let's uh, take a look at uh, some of the events that have occurred this week that relate to the Barton Moss campaign. Last week, I talked about uh, this gentleman uh, known as Kate. Kate had been remanded in custody. This is completely outrageous, despite the fact that he had eight arrests under his belt from Barton Moss. But uh, uh, four of those were related to re-arrests. Um, a deliberate attempt to get the outrageous bail conditions lifted that had been set by Greater Manchester Police. Perhaps people aren't aware that uh, when somebody is arrested and charged, the police have the power to set bail conditions, arbitrary bail conditions, which in most cases the, uh, the um, uh, person charged doesn't resist. But uh, at Barton Moss, we developed a different tactic, a different approach, because under advice from our legal team, it was um, we were made aware that if people got themselves deliberately rearrested by breaching their bail conditions, then it would be up to the magistrates to determine whether or not those bail conditions were reasonable. And pretty much in every single case during the Barton Moss campaign, the magistrates overturned the bail conditions. So the police bail conditions prevented those arrested from returning to Barton Moss. But once they were rearrested, the magistrates lifted those bail conditions, uh, stating that it was totally unreasonable to penalise somebody who had been arrested for peacefully protesting at Barton Moss. Well, Kate, top of the league table, with eight arrests to his name, was uh, jailed. He was put on remand. And initially that remand was set at six months. But fortunately there was a review of that uh, remand last week. And on uh, Tuesday, sorry, Wednesday of last week, Kate was released from Winston Green Prison. So the one and only political prisoner, because that's what he was. He was a political prisoner. He had done nothing more than demonstrate his commitment and conviction to protesting against the abomination known as hydraulic fracturing. So Kate, it's wonderful to see you free. And uh, I know that uh, you know, we shall see you at uh, future um, protection camps around the country. More of that later. Now, Kate wasn't the only person last week to get the better of the police system, the corporate system. And I have to say, thanks be to God for the judiciary, because the judiciary are upholding the law, much to the chagrin of the corporate enforcers known as the Greater Manchester Police. In reality, the Crown Prosecution Service are making themselves look totally foolish. The Crown Prosecution Service are not even upholding their own guidelines for arrests at peaceful protests. One can only assume that this is a political agenda, because if the Crown Prosecution Service upheld their own guidelines, then all charges against those arrested initially for obstructing the highway, subsequently changed to obstructing a police officer in the course of their duty, after it was established that Barton Moss Road was actually a footpath and not a highway, the Crown Prosecution Service would drop those charges. But clearly, they are being instructed from a central government level, perhaps, to plough ahead with these charges. But in reality, the judiciary are upholding the law. And last week saw further releases. Here we see uh, Kate coming out of the court. This is on um, uh, Wednesday of last week. And he's standing alongside a gentleman by the name of Mark Dent. Now, Mark Dent was outrageously accused 
of threatening one of the iGas convoy drivers, threatening to kill him, threatening to track him down to his hometown of Buxton. But in reality, there was not a shred of evidence. And in fact, the, um, uh, the driver's own witness, the driver that was following him in the convoy, his own evidence effectively destroyed the, um, the uh, drivers who claimed that Mark had threatened to kill him. The four witnesses who were at Barton Moss that day all stated that uh, Mark had uh, not in any way, shape or form threatened the driver, who of course at all times was in his cab. So after a day and a half, uh, Judge Qureshi, uh, who, by the way, the previous day had um, ripped into the Crown Prosecution Service for failing to insist that the arresting officers actually appeared before the courts, and he dismissed the charges against all three of the defendants before him. So after that case, uh, he heard the case um, of uh, Mark's alleged threatening behaviour. But after a day and a half, he ruled that um, Mark was not guilty. The evidence did not stand up to examination. Now, the small number of people in the gallery, which actually included myself, at that point uh, burst into a round of applause, at which point Judge Karishi hammered his gavel on the bench and said, quiet, I will not have this in my court. What do you think this is, the Jeremy Kyle show? Well, I was in the back row, so I hid behind the person in front. But judge, I can assure you that your comments are duly noted and um, the appropriate decorum will be maintained in your courts um, from this point forward. So the uh, uh, group were gathered outside the courts, as we see here. This is the, uh, the gathered body of supporters. Uh, as you can see, there were actually more supporters than there were seats in the courtrooms. So actually the um, uh, protectors support group here had to uh, work a rotor to be able to get into the court to see justice prevail. And uh, the following day, the charges were dropped against uh, another uh, three uh, protectors, including another one of Kate's arrest. But here you see a familiar face. This is Bear, who uh, unfortunately is uh, still not able to join us. He's still going through his, um, his move and getting uh, his um, web connectivity sorted out. But uh, those of you who watched an earlier episode of Fracking Nightmare will have seen the footage of Bear being arrested as he attempted to uh, protect an elderly uh, female uh, protester, protector, who was wrongly being arrested by the TAU, Thugs Are Us. And the key perpetrator here was um, a thug known as Officer Genge, a martial arts instructor who has tweeted that he had looked forward to another day of shoving protesters down Barton Moss Road. Well, there was considerable debate in the court about the lawfulness of forcibly pushing protectors down the road when they were clearly moving on a footpath. They were not stationary, therefore they were not blocking the footpath. And ultimately, the judge ruled that uh, the action of the Greater Manchester Police, and in particular on this day, the TAU, was indeed unlawful. Now, Bear, being familiar with the law, as uh, the female protector was being arrested, he shouted, de-arrest, de-arrest, de-arrest. And this was actually acknowledged in the courts as a recognised and um, acceptable shout in the event of a citizen recognising that a police officer was going beyond their level of responsibility and authority. And in fact, the court formally upheld that Bear was not only innocent, but indeed had behaved like a gentleman in trying to protect his fellow uh, protector on Barton Moss Road. So the count right now, I believe, is about 12-1. The, uh, the only uh, convictions actually being against um, uh, the very first uh, protector to be arrested, who by his own admission had been given plenty of warning 
but still fail to move. With that exception, every other case that has been brought before the Manchester magistrates has either been dismissed or the defendants have been found not guilty. So here is the question. It's very clear that the Crown Prosecution Service are not upholding their own guidelines. There are potentially some 200 more trials or people to be tried. Some will be on individual basis, some will be in, uh, in twos and threes. But this is going to put an enormous amount of uh, pressure on the public purse. And it's pretty obvious that uh, the vast majority of these cases are going to be thrown out of court. Now, funnily enough, the mainstream or lamestream media, as I prefer to call them, like the BBC and the Manchester Evening News, are singularly failing to report this information. Shock, horror and disbelief. Not. So the only way in which this information gets out is through mediums like uh, Fracking Nightmare, uh, through Facebook, or through the excellent online medium in uh, Manchester known as the Salford Star. But uh, the one thing that we absolutely encourage is that people share this information, spread the information. Don't worry about the fact that it's not being reported in the mainstream media. Let's create our own networks where people become aware that uh, justice is being done. Fortunately, the judiciary uh, still remains a separate from the state, at least in this particular case, and long may this continue. Meanwhile, we know we're right up against it. Um, but I have to, at this point, acknowledge the tremendous work of the uh, solicitors representing um, the, uh, the people arrested at Barton Moss. This is Lazar's solicitors. And the team at Lazar's have an enormous workload uh, with some uh, 230 arrests. I think that it's just over about, or just under 100 people, but 230 or so arrests. But Lazar's are representing um, the majority of the defendants here. And they, they have to plow through the uh, video, not only the, the video gathered by the um, evidence gatherers, the police, uh, but also by those of us that were filming and live streaming at Barton Moss. And in many cases, this film footage has been absolutely instrumental in demonstrating that the police recollection of the event is um, uh, somewhat flawed. I think one of the lessons that we've learned this week is that one should never use the word lie in the witness box. The term mistaken is, uh, is preferred. Uh, to use the word lie is to uh, potentially um, see your own character uh, challenged directly in cross-examination. So the word mistaken. Well, let me uh, make it very clear that uh, it would seem to date that the vast majority of the Greater Manchester Police who have been called to give evidence uh, in these uh, various trials live in a mistaken reality. And uh, if you want some entertainment, then go along to uh, Manchester Magistrates Courts and uh, watch these cases unfold for yourself. But thanks very much to Simon Levar, uh, Liz, um, Lazars, uh, Simon Pook, who's coordinating the activity there, and uh, Richard Brigman, who, uh, as a barrister, is doing a truly outstanding job. So thank you very much indeed to all that team. Now, this game use the term loosely, is hotting up. We've uh, seen the Murdoch right-wing media this week ramp up the calls for the country to, here we go, get fracking. And this was um, uh, an editorial that appeared uh, the day before the release of the Lord's Economics Committee's uh, report stating that Britain needs to cut red tape and get Britain fracking, says the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee is expected to call on Thursday for a more streamlined planning and permits process to deliver a UK shale gas boom. During a nine month inquiry, peers were told that the industry could create more than 100,000 jobs and help cut energy costs, but is here being held up by bureaucracy. Here's another example of making numbers up as you go along, because uh, at no point to this uh, up until now has any report ever got anywhere close to uh, talking about 100,000 jobs. And um, in fact, in reality, it's uh, uh, maybe not even 10% of that number. 
Uh, the Murdoch media, not least the Sun, running its populist articles. Uh, here we go, Frack Pool. The push for the first UK well in Blackpool. Well, let me um, pull out a little bit of uh, that article attributed here to smooth talking, although um, a somewhat haggard looking uh, chief executive officer of Quadrilla, Francis Egan, who is uh, quoted here, said the UK would be insane if it does not search for shale gas. An interesting play on words here, Francis, because uh, there's a hell of a difference between searching and, of course, exploiting. And the reality is that the UK would be insane if it actually exploits this resource, because, as you well know, Francis, the industry does not have a safe technology for exploiting shale gas, period. But in that article, it says uh, Quadrilla's move uh, to start fracking comes after the farmers gave the go ahead to use land at Roseacre and Preston New Road. Well, the farmers have clearly been um, made an offer that they felt they couldn't refuse. Effectively, they have been bribed. So this is how communities are split. So the article goes on. The application will cover drilling, hydraulic fracturing and testing the flow of gas for six years. If approved, the wells could create tens of thousands of jobs and give the seaside resort a huge boost. Tens of thousands of jobs. Come on. Even Quadrilla's own documentation and presentations do not talk about tens of thousands of jobs. This is the Murdoch media literally making stuff up as they go along. The article also in the, uh, um, the page the previous day, um, their article claimed that the people want hydraulic fracturing. No, they don't. Everywhere you go around the country, if it's an area that's already being targeted by the mother frackers, then it's some 80% of people who do not want it in their community. And even in areas where hydraulic fracturing is not yet on the immediate horizon, it's over 50% who do not want it. And that's based on very limited research by those people. Because once they do start to do the research, then they will very quickly come to the realization that this is not something that they want, not only anywhere near their backyard, but anywhere else in the country. Now, somebody who has uh, put their neck on the block to try and prevent this uh, nightmare occurring is Bez, the former frontman for Happy Mondays. Of course, he's being demonized by the uh, Murdoch and the rest of the mainstream media. It says the anti-fracking brigade's credibility plunged to new depths last night as Bez of Happy Mondays urged Prince Charles to block drilling. Bez, 50, famed for his dancing during the band's gigs, had already launched a shake of maracas if you're against frackers drive. Uh, the star who plans to stand in the general election told Charles, we are appealing to you to help us raise awareness of the risks to our environment due to fracking. Well, as Charles's mother stands to uh, benefit enormously, I don't think you're going to get too much joy from Prince Charles, but uh, good on you for trying, Bez. The reality is that um, Bez, along with the Green Party, are, of course, the only candidates who uh, are standing on a ticket that is anti-fracking. Every one of the major parties is pro-fracking. But, uh, you know, as we have said before, they have to overcome the people. And uh, right now, in the Hull area, uh, Rathlin Energy, who I talked about last week because they'd had uh, two uh, planning applications granted to run um, acid fracks using uh, 15,000 uh, gallons of um, hydrochloric acid at a 15% solution. And you can see there two wells there here in, um, uh, in Beverly. Uh, this is um, West Newton and this is uh, Crawberry Hill. And I'm pleased to say and pleased to announce that there are a couple of new holiday destinations. And here we see the camp uh, being established. And uh, uh, here's the people, uh, the gathered body, some veterans from Barton Moss and uh, Balkan, uh, but also uh, some local people there who have come to support the establishment of these two new camps in Humberside. So Rathlin Energy, um, you're going to need to uh, go through a process to be able to uh, get your 
bits in the ground, as of course will be the newly created company of Digas. Uh, previously known as Dart Energy and iGas, uh, iGas have announced that they have uh, made a, uh, an, a, a, a bid to acquire Dart Energy. Uh, we have no idea what the new company will be called, but uh, for the time being, we'll call it Digas. And the competition for next week is to come up with an appropriate logo for Digas and a very, a very appropriate name for this um, uh, group of motherfuckers. Well, um, I would encourage you to take a look at the Lord's report. I would also encourage you, because I don't want to uh, uh, take too much more time on this subject tonight, because we have something very, very important to uh, introduce you to tonight. But I would encourage you to take a look at the Lord's economic report and also take a look at the vested interests of the participants in that uh, study. These individuals are not looking after the best interests of the population. They are appointed into these positions. They are unelected and uh, they obviously feel that they will gain significantly financially by encouraging the British government to reduce the red tape and get this country fracking. I am pleased to say that the population of this country has very, very different ideas and is going to make that task as difficult as it possibly can. Now, we're going to go into the break in just a second. And in this break, in the two breaks tonight, we're going to use the breaks to show short videos. And in the first break, it's going to be a bit of an introduction to the campaign at Bentley in New South Wales, Australia. This right now is the global front line in the fracking agenda. Some two and a half, three thousand people are gathered at Bentley to prevent um, the, uh, the frackers getting their bits in the ground. And we're going to join um, Mike, Mike New and uh, Dave Schreiber at the Bentley camp. And they're going to walk us around the camp and um, introduce us to some of the, the key players there and uh, what they're expecting. It's estimated that some 1,000 police are being mobilised in an attempt to try to get the infrastructure onto the well site. But let's go into the break and take a look at this short video of Bentley. blessed every day to wake up in such a beautiful place. Look, this is not Syria, you know, we're, this, this is Australia. The people of this region have made it abundantly clear that they do not want their region covered in these industrial gas fields. People in the northern rivers have fought for their forests, they've fought for their clean water. We're not going to roll over for some fossil fuel mob that's going to come in and rip the guts out of the, the farming and the tourism. And the interested in the dollars and cents. Just encourage people to act and think about air and water and ecosystems more than they ever have before because they're slipping out of our grasp. Gas fields free. Dig into your heart. Red gas has got to go! Red gas has got to go! It's as simple as that, isn't it? Bugger all. And welcome back to part two. And I'm pleased to say that we do have Dan and Mike online live from Bentley in New South Wales. Now, just to remind our viewers where Bentley in New South Wales is, here we see the, the map. And uh, here's, um, here's uh, Bentley, a few miles to the west of uh, the community of Lismore. 
Uh, here's Byron Bay. That's probably a sort of better known landmark. Byron Bay, a well known um, uh, uh, Totnes or Glastonbury of, uh, of the east coast of Australia. Very pleasant place where I spent a few days uh, last year. And a little way into the hinterland here is Bentley. It's also just south of the border between New South Wales and Queensland. And in the next break, we're going to take a look at the magnitude of drilling that has taken place in Queensland over the past few years. And uh, once uh, you realise what has occurred just to the north of Bentley, um, perhaps it starts to put in perspective why there is such enormous resistance to Met Gasco getting their bits in the ground in New South Wales. So, Dan, Mike, uh, are you online? Yes, we're here, and we've started at the, the entrance here, and as you can see, when injustice becomes law, resistance becomes duty. That's the, the, the name of the game here. And of course, this, uh, all these yellow tags are the people who are working. They've got 95s and they can't be here. These, these are their, their avatars they've sent um, as a vigil. And this is the entrance as you come off the highway. Um, I'll, we're gonna give you a quick camp tour uh, so we're on the main road here between Lismore and Kyogo. How far away are you and from the nearest community? It's a little bit... Uh, Lismore's about 10 minutes away. And Mike's just finishing up uh, an interview here. Um, by ABC TV, by Women's Weekly. French TV. And, and uh, he'll be joining us soon. We, I'm going to take you through the. This is the entrance way when you arrive off the off the main road. This is. The is this the entrance, entrance to the camp, or or will it be the entrance to the well site as well? This is the entrance to the camp, and you can see it's a uh, an alcohol and drug drug free and gas free, of course. And how, how many people no, would you it's, estimate it's are on the camp? Oh, there we go. How many people would you estimate are on the camp at the moment? At the moment, there's just a skeleton crew of probably a couple of hundred. And at the weekend, how many did you have at the weekend? Uh, there was Mother's Day, and so there was probably about a thousand. But they're expecting. Um, we've we've heard stories that that there may be up to about ten thousand. The people coming from all over the country, even. Uh, even even a few from abroad. Uh, okay, uh, we, uh, go on. We, got, uh, we had a bit of a lock up there. I, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, the signal is not fantastic. Um, thanks. I'll, I'll try and keep moving so we get a good signal. Um, but this is the main information tent. Um, people are generally signing in. And, and signing like a waiver. Um, and essentially what's happening is uh, this is the this is our base camp and our main uh, action is just up the road. And this is our, uh, I'm, I'm taking you now to the main hub. Uh, this is our, our tea and coffee, uh, our, our caffeine church. Uh, a caffeine church, I like that. <laughs> the minister was quite helping us build it. And so that, that's been kind of interesting journey. And so it's still pretty early in the morning here. Um, it's about 6.30, isn't it? 6.30 Six, so your time? See this. this is the... Yeah, 6.30 our time, yeah. And these are the two main main fires at camp here. So the focus doesn't look so good. And uh, uh, the two fires that have been burning uh, continuously for about three months. We've got a sacred fire and a, a more social fire. Sorry, the signal's not so good. So what, what, what's the temperature there? Because you're coming into your winter, uh, which, um, of course, being in, uh, in, in uh, northern New South Wales, everything is relative. But uh, you know, what, what sort of temperatures uh, does it get down to at night and get up to it during the day? 
Well, we, we did have a cold snap, um, and it doesn't get, you know, particularly cold. We got maybe down to six degrees, um, six degrees in, in the middle of the night. And um, the daytime when the sun comes out, it goes all the way up to 20 degrees, so it's not bad. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good spread. I could I could deal with that. It's a it's a little bit warmer than we had at um, uh, at Barton Moss, where uh, in um, uh, November and early December it actually got down to about minus four and, and didn't go above freezing for about uh, four days. Uh, it looks like we we've, we've lost the uh, connection there. Um, and we, we know that it's uh, it, right on the edge of the reception area, so we're going to try and get um, Dan back with us as quickly as we possibly can. Just to uh, uh, show, let's show you this picture here. This is from a couple of weekends ago, and uh, this was the, uh, the camp uh, when they had some 2,000 people there. And um, we've got another shot here. This is the entrance. Now Dan's uh, in the process of uh, walking us down to the uh, the site entrance there where they have those uh, poles uh, fixed in the ground and um, uh, as you see that you will see later on there are people permanently on the on the top of those poles now Dan's back with us so Dan yes hey yeah. how are you going I'm good I'm good if you if we do lose you we'll keep coming and uh, trying to get you back there we go excellent okay and uh, hi there Mike Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing this? Oh, you've got um, is that French TV behind you there? That's that's French TV, French media. You know, like UK was obviously they were wiser. They stayed back home, and the French sent their team all the way out here. Well, of course, what's very interesting is that the uh, French uh, Cancel Constitutionnel have, of course, um, outlawed hydraulic fracturing in France. Uh, they upheld yeah. the uh, presidential ban, yeah. but the uh, the French companies Total and Gaz de France have actually bought into the uh, unconventional gas industry in the UK. So, um, can you tell the camera crew that they're very welcome to take the French companies back because we don't want them yeah, here in the UK? Yeah, I know, and it, it's interesting. Some of the um, fracking technology apparently was developed right here in uh, a university just 10 minutes from where we're standing, uh, some of the liquid fracking technology. Um, and of course, some of the Australian companies um, are apparently fracking all around the world. So, you know, it's a, it's a, a mixed batch. Yeah, very, very much so, very much so. So we've got a good picture there. So where, where are you now within the camp? Um, we're kind of in the main hub here. Behind us are these two... Uh, fires that are burning continuously. So that's, I guess, the main meeting place. Um, and I, I think what what we wanted to jump into is a little bit of um, some some lawful tactics that that are unfolding here and may have implications for the rest of the world. Um, and really, you know, possibly that that information as it gets shared. Um, helps people come to like a, I guess, a place of self-responsibility, and to do it in a way that's that's honourable is really the trick here. To to not go to war because going to war with, you know, these large uh, bodies. They they're well funded, they're well oiled, and they've got essential armies. You know, with batons and tasers and capsicum spray. So, you know. We've chosen the path of uh, of least resistance here because, of course, we were disarmed. Um, you know, all the guns were confiscated after they created a few false flags with uh, Martin Bryant down in Tasmania. Tasmania, yep, yep. Just coming out. And, and you guys don't have guns either, different to the United States, where they can at least mount a militia. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think. I mean, I think the other part of that, Dan, is of course, you know, we're standing here in peace and we're creating, we're moving into, you know, a new peaceful paradigm, and we want to create from that space of our true values, which is, you know, honour and respect and, and, and peace and love and care for the earth. Um, and if we do that with violence, then clearly, you know, we're just recreating 
the old way of doing things. Well, absolutely yeah. right, and that's the common denominator. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if uh, you guys were uh, able to tune in to the first part of the programme, but uh, here in the UK, uh, the Barton Moss campaign, which ran through the winter, uh, despite the uh, attempts to intimidate the protection community and, and get a, a reaction, um, they didn't achieve that, and the protection community remained peaceful throughout. And, and now in the courts, all the cases are basically being dismissed or the defendants found not guilty because uh, basically they were um, practicing the rights of peaceful protest. But there are moves in the UK to effectively abolish common law uh, with a view to introducing Napoleonic or civil law uh, within the next few years. And of course, if that happens here, then it will um, follow suit uh, in the rest of uh, the Commonwealth, as it were. So, you know, what your initiative right now, I think, is very important. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, I didn't quite hear, hear it. Yeah, more about the, the peaceful initiative, Ian? Yes, oh, yeah. yes. So, yeah. Look, I mean, the initiative that's been running here has been going on for four years. It's, you know, it started with organisations like Northern Rivers Gasfield Free and Lock the Gate. Um, it's been a huge community campaign of awareness and education. Um, followed by a very effective tool where every community in the Northern Rivers or most communities in the Northern Rivers have gone around polling door to door, every single door and taking a survey. Um, the simple question that was asked, and this wording's not exact, but was basically, do you want um, gas, do you want a gas, field, a gas field to be established around your town, you know, in this area? And the answer to that has been at least 85% or more no. Yeah. Um, so it's been a huge um, tool to demonstrate essentially the will of the people and that, and that these mining companies and the, and the government, in a sense, has no social license to be doing this business here. But they're still going to... Yeah. The, the government... The issuing of the licences has been... Uh, now unfolding steadily in New South Wales and in Queensland. And so the, they're questioning the very validity of those licences. But, of course, because there's such a large majority of the people going against it, it, it seems like um, lawfully there, should, you know, there needs to be a mandate as to, uh, you know, to stop this process. And some of the things we've looked at is doing a three-step administrative process, which is really contract law, around which most of law is based anyway, um, and issuing notices to to initially put on notice the police, the police commissioner, uh, uh, the parliament, um, in the whole of the Australian government to say, look, um, if you proceed past this point, these are the terms and conditions. And if you break the terms and conditions, these are the damages we'll be seeking. And, um, and then sent them a fee schedule so that they understand really clearly what sort of contract they're getting into from our side. Um, of course, we've also got this um, a very strong um, indigenous land claim here. The Origines here have been um, setting up paperwork to question uh, um, the, Crown, the Crown's jurisdiction um, on the land because according to British uh, and Crown law, there have to be one of three things to take land. It has to either be one in a war or it has to be um, a treaty with the locals or it has to be uh, uninhabited and uh, all three of those have been extinguished and so essentially there's no actual crown land claim on this land and so the, uh, the local mobs have all got together and have uh, started to put up the paperwork to reclaim the land and so that's going to actually become part of our claim in terms of whether the gas, gas leases are legal and whether there's a, a big trespass issue, a giant trespass issue in this case. Yeah, in, indeed. And the, the whole issue of um, the um, original uh, land ownership, I think, was actually tested over in northern, uh, the northwestern part of, um, of uh, Western Australia. 
and there was massive uh, celebrations when the land was effectively handed back to the um, native population uh, only for two or three years later for it to be taken back by the state. So, I mean, unfortunately, they have obviously uh, legal teams that are extremely creative and extremely manipulative. And uh, if they feel that uh, the better is being God of them, then they will just redouble their efforts to uh, get it overturned. Yeah, that that's essentially correct. But there's a there's a massive movement, and I'm sure it's happening in the UK as well. Um, a sovereign uh, movement, so where people are are rapidly learning about the law and learning what parts of the law get the best remedy. And you know, around here, equity and contract law has enabled us to to step into a, a whole new realm of getting remedy uh, through the equity courts and so unlike um, common law which has held people up for years and just round and round yeah. in the court yeah. system bankrupting them and using up all their time um, the contract law seems to be becoming very effective and, and getting remedy and damages so it makes companies whose bottom lines are obviously around uh, profits, as soon as it looks like it may become unprofitable, um, there's a big change. But of course, this particular thing is, is deeper than profits as well, because this is about, um, you know, about Agenda 21 and a eugenics program as well, which I know is controversial, but not on your show. Yeah, absolutely. Well, probably, but uh, nonetheless, I mean, it, it is undeniable. Now, guys, don't run away because I want to take a, a short break here and I want to show um, a short video prepared by Barry Monk um, just over the border in uh, in southern Queensland. And uh, you know, Barry put this video together to indicate the speed with which the gas industry had, if, had effectively established their infrastructure in um, uh, southern Queensland over the past few years. So the title of this is Where Are the Gas Wells? And I think for our viewers, it will put into perspective why it is that the people of New South Wales are so determined to ensure that the likes of Magasco and the other companies do not get their bits in the ground. By Barry's own admission, as you will see in the video, the people of Queensland were caught asleep at the wheel. And I know that that's not going to happen with you guys. So stay online and uh, join you in part three. So where are the gas wells? Number one, Tara Township. Here's the town of Tara. Let's zoom out and find a common radius measurement. So we're looking at about uh, 18 kilometres, so that would put six gas wells within 18 kilometres. So number two, Chinchilla Township. So here's the township of Chinchilla. We zoom out, we get our 18 kilometres again, which gives us about 10 gas wells within the 18 kilometre radius. Now number three, Dolby Township. Okay, so the Dolby Township, let's zoom out, get to our measurement tool, and for Dolby we end up with uh, one gas well within a 19 kilometre radius. Number four, the unlucky ones in the gas fields. This is QGC BG Group's Kenya Gas Fields processing plant on the edge of several residential estates and farms. The evaporation ponds alone cover almost five and a half kilometres. So let's put it in perspective. Let's zoom out from the town of Chinchilla and make a comparison. The entire width from town end to end is uh, 3.21 kilometres. The length is about 3.29 kilometres. The evaporation ponds would cover Chinchilla one and a half times. Let's zoom out from one of QGC's gas fields. Yes, the dots are gas wells. Yes, the industry isn't even exporting yet. Go to our measurement tool and we have around a 22 kilometre radius. Now I'll give you an example of just how safe human beings will be throughout Australia with the unconventional gas industry. QGC's Cape Well Cluster is in the heart of a residential estate. So Toowoomba, unconventional gas has its eyes seriously fixed on you and your surrounds. So no gas wells within a 32 kilometre radius, but if we go for a flight out to your west, you'll see the multinational giants aren't too far away. 
We pass Mount Irving, Mount Moriah, West Prairie, Cecil Plains, Grassdale, Cumberilla. Are you enjoying the flight? Bilby. Kogan. We and Billa. I can't see why people are whinging. This should be in everyone's backyard, shouldn't it? Here's QGC's tenements. Origin Energy's tenements. Oh, hang on. They're actually multinational corporations. Do you want this where you live? And ending with miles. And how about a flyover from Cecil Plains to central Queensland? This is beautiful farming country. Unfortunately, those that are fixated on containment of the unconventional gas global giants are delusional. Prime agricultural land represents easier, more accessible drilling. It is not protected. As the government has indicated, it does not have the right to take a landholder's right to negotiate with a gas company away from them, even if they are on prime agricultural land. Zooming out and moving further north now, you can see we've really been asleep at the wheel. Zooming in, the blurred clusters turn into definable spots, each one potentially causing irreversible damage to the country. I just cannot stress enough that a majority of the unconventional gas wells are not yet in production. The true effects will become undeniable upon export. What's the scale of damage over Queensland so far? The gas industry is only in first gear in one state, covering over a thousand kilometres long, over 300 kilometres wide. Some very credible projections put total potential unconventional gas well numbers in excess of 200,000 for Queensland alone. It is not the intent of this video to encourage a defeatist thought process. On the contrary, unconventional gas has been heavily wounded in the eyes of the public. Our window of opportunity still exists. Think national, not not in my backyard. Stop the first export train, the Surat Basin to Gladstone's Curtis Island, and stop the unconventional gas industry in this country. And welcome back to part three of Fracking Nightmare. Now, I had shown that uh, animation in a previous episode of Fracking Nightmare, but the reason that it's so pertinent to tonight's show is, as Barry Monk says at the end of that video, we were caught asleep at the wheel. Despite the fact that people had gone over from the US to Queensland, to express their concerns about the process of hydraulic fracturing, the people of Queensland either chose to ignore it or decided that uh, it was being exaggerated. Well, the people of New South Wales, many of them, of course, have driven into southern Queensland and they've seen the effects of this industry for themselves which is why they are now congregating at Bentley in the Northern Rivers area of uh, Northern New South Wales to resist the gas industry from establishing a foothold in their state. So online I have uh, Dan Schreiber and Mike New. This is live from Bentley. It's about uh, quarter to seven on Tuesday morning in, in Bentley there. So um, Dan, Mike, you back with us? Hey, hey Ian, um, you know, just to, just for the record, this is the largest uh, protest movement in Australia's history uh, that we're witnessing here. Um, and like I said, there's people coming from all over the country. And within, within that uh, motion, there's going to be a massive standoff. And if we can keep this protest peaceful, I think this will be possibly the big turning point. Um, of course, there's tons of corruption that have gone on uh, in New South Wales and, and the Queensland corruption makes the New South Wales corruption seem like child's play. And so even though the Crime Commission is now ejecting, you know, politicians and police ministers left, right and centre, when it gets to Queensland, it's going to be, it's, it's like a joke, the, the nepotism and the cronyism that has uh, been unfolding in you know, in the government backhanders and, you know, I'm probably not even 
potentially in, uh, potentially in a libelous state saying what I'm saying. <laughs> Well, and the good news is, the only good news is that, um, you know, the fact that, that uh, the magnitude of the corruption is becoming public knowledge, then it's uh, it's raising the awareness, um, you know, of the issue because Australians have a reputation, I think you said yourself last week, you know, Australians are laid back and they were looking for the you know, easy life. Uh, and yet there's an increasing realisation that that lifestyle is right now under threat, you know, particularly in a country that is is um, already uh, having to manage its uh, water resources and, and now we've got an industry that's trying to get a foothold that is intent on effectively destroying those water resources. Yeah, yeah, completely. And it's fascinating in this area, Ian, that um, the local water, people responsible for drinking water and public water, Rouse Water, um, has said that within 10 years, uh, demand will outstrip the local water supply. Um, and they've developed... Um, their water plan is to use groundwater um, <laughs> drink, for drinking water for the locals. So, you know, clearly Rouse Water is, you know, is very concerned. And, and, and given that plan, you know, how, it's just ludicrous that these um, mining licences are being issued. And that, that's, a plan, that's a water plan or a water strategy that doesn't take account of the hydraulic fracturing, the unconventional gas industry establishing a foothold, correct? Yeah, correct. That that water management plan was done pre, you know, pre CSG, um, pre unconventional gas mining coming to this area, and 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 now that body that's managing the water is you know extremely concerned. You know, how how are people going to? have clean drinking water in 10 years' time. Yeah, and, and as you rightly say, the anti-fracking movement is the fastest growing, uh, and I use the term loosely, environmental movement, not just in Australia, but uh, you know, in, in, in all countries now that are trying to establish this, uh, this industry. But I know that in Queensland, um, particularly in the, uh, in the north of the state, the uh, Great Artesian Basin Protection Community is also a rapidly um, uh, expanding movement because the mining industry is extracting water out of the Great Artesian Basin at a rate six times greater than it can naturally replenish. Absolutely, and and we don't even know, you know, there's other science saying that the Great Artesian Basin isn't even replenished by rainwater, um, and so we get we're down to the last few percent here, and you know that. As, as it's quite commonly referred to, that there's going to be huge water shortages all around the world, you know, and it's going to be one of the, the tightest sought-after resources. Um, so, so to do something like this is either calculated and, you know, call me a conspiracy theorist, but um, the, the companies behind this are notorious for wrecking something and then offering us an expensive solution to fix it. Well, exactly. And I mean, that's why Nestle are um, responding to the, uh, the interview that uh, Peter Brabeck gave in, in 2005, where he stated that access to fresh water should not be regarded as a, a human right. I mean, basically, he was alluding to the fact that unless you're on the corporate payroll, uh, you have no um, right to the fundamentals of life. And uh, of course, Nestle is now literally buying up the world's fresh water supplies, particularly That's right. in Canada, uh, you know, where they're buying access to the lakes, bottling it, well, processing it, bottling it, and of course, adding the appropriate um, chemicals like uh, fluoride and um, allegedly even lithium. Yeah, you know, it's, it, you know, it happened here. Eddie O'Bead was one of the corrupt New South Wales politicians um, that was found by the inquiry here, and and interestingly enough. Part of his business was to acquire all the rights for the water management for Sydney, you know, a, a city of five, six, seven million people. Um, so there's definitely some kind of planning behind this going a on. A little bit of a conflict of interest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. And, uh, you know, as you rightly say, um, uh, Agenda 21 is, uh, is something that is dismissed. Um, but in reality, of course, Agenda 21 has been around uh, since the um, uh, Rio conference of 1992. Uh, we, we actually discussed it on a few weeks ago on another program that I do called Humanity versus Insanity. Uh, and we looked at the, uh, the architects of Agenda 21, of course, uh, Michaela Gorbachev and um, Maurice Strong. 
And the fact that it has been UN policy uh, for, um, well, what is it now, 22 years. Yes. And, and yet, fortunately, more and more people are becoming aware uh, of Agenda 21. Um, so uh, they're in the process of, uh, of rebranding it. But, um, you know, we, we've also talked about, uh, you know, the, um, the significance of the land grabs. And, uh, yeah. you know, obviously in the U.S. with the, the recent events with the uh, Bundy Ranch in uh, Nevada. Um, and, you know, we're seeing it uh, elsewhere around the, uh, the planet. So this is something that the establishment wants people to believe is simply in the realms of conspiracy. And yet, if uh, people actually take the time to read the document, I mean, admittedly, it's, what, 257 pages, 19 chapters. Uh, but if people actually take the time to read it, they will realise how pernicious this agenda is. And as you rightly say, uh, you know, if this was part of a plan and somebody is literally trying to uh, establish total dominion over uh, the global water supplies uh, by poisoning... Uh, that which is currently freely available, I couldn't think of a quicker way of doing it. Yeah, there's um, a quite a famous uh, YouTube clip from maybe about six months ago with an uh, Australian politician mentioning Agenda 21, and uh, it went viral. Um, it created a bit of a stir. And, you know, I think Australia's, you know, they they tend to have have it pretty good and so people are lax until you know until the the, the hornet's nest is really stirred in their area but um northern rivers i think i think that may be slipped up a little bit because our area is a hotbed of uh awake people and there's you know there's going to be a serious movement and this is you know this this is a serious stand here you know the people here that are you know, there's there's farmers and there's um, kids and knitting nanas and you know it's a real cross. Um, it really is a cross, cross section of, of the whole of society here, and yeah, you know that's one of the things that's the power of this movement. You know, it's giving authorities a big headache. You know, it's not it's not the greenies. You know, yeah. it's not the hippies. It's the whole community. Yeah, and as um, you know, some people have been saying here. You know. The riot police can come here for two weeks, for three weeks, but we live here. Well, you know, we're here 365 days a year. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and as you absolutely uh, rightly say, the it's paramount that, of course, it's kept peaceful and that, uh, you know, everybody understands that, um, uh, you know, to rise to the bait that will, it will inevitably put out there is to give them just the excuse they need to uh, up the ante. They haven't managed that in the UK, and I'm sure they're not going to manage it in Australia. By, by the way, the um, Australian politician was, uh, I believe, a lady called Anne Bressington. And uh, you're, you're right. I remember seeing the uh, the video, um, and uh, of course it uh, it did go viral. Um, and then Anne Bressington conveniently sort of disappeared from the uh, the media. But I would encourage people do the research for yourself. Um, look at the work of yep. not only Anne Bressington but uh, Rosa Quara as well. Uh, who, by the way, I'm hoping will be our um, keynote speaker at the Alternative View Six in uh, 2015. Now guys, we've got just got a couple of minutes and uh, I want to thank you so much for once again joining us and uh, I mean I think it's absolutely essential that uh, you know I get you up this early next week as well because clearly events are unfolding at an enormous uh, uh, rate and, and like I've said, Bentley is without any shadow of doubt the global front line in fighting the mother frackers. So um, you, you've got the potential uh, of uh, about a, a thousand or so riot police uh, joining you. Um, and uh, hopefully people watching this uh, from all over Australia will make the effort, if they can, in any way, shape or form, to get down to Bentley to support you guys because we have to nip this in the bud. As Barry Monk said, you know, Queensland was caught asleep at the wheel. That ain't going to be the case in New South Wales. No. And there's already talk of, you know, a, a small police mutiny that may grow in this coming week as as D-Day approaches. Um, the local uh, companies are refusing to support them uh, to supply security fans and catering and accommodation. And there's it, it really is dividing into these two kind of camps and 
uh, it's it's being seen as really not cool to be supporting you know anything to do with the gas industry. So it, it it's going to be a a major social political upheaval in the area, and you know um, there, there's people are really rethinking what's going on on a big level here. It's it's really sparked a lot of little fires and. You know, those fires are all going to join on the weekend. Um, and the, I think they've given us a massive opportunity to educate a whole bunch of people on the social change and also on the, the sovereignty and, and people standing up for true people power. And, and literally, if the government are not following their will, to chuck them out and start again. And so I think people are starting to understand that they do have authority and they do have power and um, if they do not consent, uh, they do not consent and government has no authority. They just need to be able to draw a line in the sand and hold their ground and this is this is what's being taught and this is what's being spurned here and so this is a fantastic opportunity. Guys, that's, you, that's you really... are... sorry, Mike, carry on. That's right. If we, if, we, um, if we talk again this time next week, it is this time that we're expecting the police action to start, so... Okay. It could be a could be a very interesting show. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, look, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to uh, spread the word and uh, encourage people uh, as much as possible. Share this uh, program. Uh, let's get it uh, viral across all the social media. Uh, let's let's ensure that there are ten or twenty thousand people at Bentley at the weekend. This is the global front line to fight the mother frackers. If uh, if I had the resources, I'd be on a plane and uh, getting down to uh, Bentley myself. This this is absolutely crucial. Guys, you are an absolute inspiration. You know, we have embryonic preemptive camps now being established around the UK and I hope what we're able to, or you guys are able to share with us from Bentley becomes the template for the future. And those companies in the UK like Digas and Rathian Energy and Quadzilla, then you better understand that you have no social license. Join us next week on Fracking Nightmare.